Hello, good morning and good afternoon. My name is Andy Fife, and I'm from the nonprofit uh, BLAB US in Canada. And we're honored that you all are joining us today uh, for this opportunity. Uh, so we invite you to introduce yourself over the chat with your name and the company that you are representing. Uh, maybe let us know a little bit about the mission of your company. Uh, and then you can also use the Q&A here to uh, ask any questions. And our team here is standing by uh, monitoring uh, that chat. Uh, to help answer those, and then we'll have a little bit of time, hopefully at the end, uh, to discuss any questions that, that might come up. Uh, so just to remind you all, just to make sure that you are where you hope to be, uh, is that the purpose of today's session is to discuss the legal requirement for B Corp certification, uh, specifically for U.S. corporations, and what the process is for becoming a benefit corporation. Uh, so most of you all are actively uh, pursuing B Corp certification, and so we want to make sure that the process and reasoning for this important element of certification is more easily understood and that you really get your questions answered. So today, uh, I'll, I'll kick us off. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the purpose. Uh, please do introduce yourself over the chat if you're just joining now. Uh, and then we will speak briefly on the legal requirement itself, what its origin story is, why it's important as part of certification. Uh, and then we are honored uh, to have a couple of distinguished guests uh, to join us from the B Corp community who have experience and expertise around making this uh, switch themselves or for their clients. So for us at BLAB, we have an ambitious vision of building a new economic system that works for everybody and for the long run. Uh, we have a mission to create a more equitable, regenerative, and inclusive economic system for all people and planet. Uh, and obviously a big piece of this is that we work within the confines of capitalism. Uh, and historically, that has been uh, really held up against a very short-term view, uh, extractive and a very a narrow focus of fiduciary duty. Uh, and so what we're hoping to do is to create a more uh, a community that can represent a different way of doing business and arguably a, a new corporate form that more companies can adopt, which we'll talk about today. So taking a step back, uh, what we're looking at now is that there are over 4,000 certified B Corps around the world, uh, represented and operating across more than 75 countries and more than 150 industries. I think what's important here is to note is that uh, the majority of the certified B Corp community is made up of companies that are under 2 million in revenue, under 10 full-time employees. And so the hope here is that not just the assessment, but also this legal framework can really build a foundation for small but growing companies uh, to grow, but to grow uh, in a way that's aligned to their mission uh, and with the integrity of the, of the story of why they started their company in the first place. And so as most of you all know, there are three key pillars or requirements of B Corp certification. One is that every company has to work through the B Impact Assessment and earn a score of at least 80 points. Uh, every company has to meet a higher level of transparency, uh, which you can see uh, on the B Corp directory. Uh, you can look up the two companies that will be joining us today. Uh, and then third, and related to the conversation we are having uh, this morning or this afternoon is discussing the legal framework. So every certified B Corp around the world, to the extent possible, has adopted uh, a broader aperture of their legal governance to consider all stakeholders and not just shareholders or not just profit maximization. And so looking at the roadmap, which uh, most of you all are on, uh, I think first what's important is just to understand what that legal requirement and pathway is. Uh, and so we'll discuss that for you all today. Uh, and then obviously not just going through the assessment, but also meeting that legal requirement uh, as it's part of the uh, certification and working with that within the app of the assessment that you're currently working through. And we also wanna acknowledge that uh, we have been learning about what are some of the roadblocks or barriers that companies have been facing through the process. 60% uh, of companies that submit their assessments do not end up certifying. Uh, you can see a few of the reasons that we've heard uh, below, but obviously two of them that are related to today. Uh, one is that maybe documentation just hasn't been prepared. And documentation also includes being able to upload and show that you've made this legal commitment for your company. Um, the second 
is maybe the labor requirement just hasn't been understood, or maybe it hasn't been socialized early and often enough with some of the decision makers, or if you have a board, or any of your early stage investors, if you have any. So hopefully this resource today can be helpful for that. And as of earlier this year, uh, companies that have less than 50 full-time employees, this legal requirement is actually required uh, before uh, you uh, enter the review process uh, for your certification. And so that's another reason why we wanted to host these sessions. We've already hosted one for LLCs operating in the US, as well as Canadian companies, uh, given that benefit company is now available uh, in British Columbia. And so with this, I'm going to pass it over to our uh, head of stakeholder governance and policy, Holly and Sam Barstow, to speak on a few of the different variations of what this corporate form could look like for corporations. And then she will pass it off to our following two guests. Thanks, Andy. And it's wonderful to be here and, and see everyone on the call today. Um, the actual legal requirement for individual companies differs depending on the legal entity type of the company, as well as the place of jurisdiction. Um, that means that the pathway to the legal requirement for an individual company changes depending on where you are and what you are. Um, the best way to figure out your pathway for your company is check, to check out the legal requirement um, roadmap tool that is available on our website and linked in the slides. Um, but we're here specifically to talk about the pathway for corporations. Um, now, because corporate law is administered um, at an individual state level, the requirement for US corporations actually changes depending on which state you're in and, and the pathway um, uh, is complicated. There are actually four different possibilities for corporations depending on your state. Um, the most likely pathway for you is available in around 40 different states, and that is the benefit corporation status, which is um, what we're going to talk about today and hear more from from Kevin. Um, in a few different states, there's a, a slightly lesser version of benefit corporation available that is often called social, social purpose corporation. Um, in those states, your approach is to adopt social purpose corporation status, but then add in sp some specific legal language that actually brings it up to the level of the benefit corporation. Um, and in still a few more states, we actually don't have um, benefit corp passed yet or social pur purpose corporation legislation passed either. And in those states, we have something called a constituency statute that's part of corporate law. And that allows corporations to build in the legal requirement into their existing charter or articles as a regular corporation. And in still fewer states, we actually have no pathway to meet the legal requirement at all. And so your requirement is just um, to sign our term sheet and then to adopt the legal requirement once we have passed benefit corporation legislation in your state. So complicated, but hopefully the legal requirement tool on our website will help you figure it out. And hopefully Kevin will provide a, a great overview of the pathway for the vast majority of you, which is benefit corp. Um, next slide, please. So now this webinar is focused on the benefit corporation uh, legal requirement, which is the pathway um, for almost everyone, hopefully, that's on this call. Um, Kevin will get into the details, but um, you know, just to provide a very broad overview, a benefit corporation is at its heart a, a traditional corporation. It has all the same protections and permissions as a traditional business corporation. It even has the same tax status, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, it's just got additional obligations regarding its purpose, accountability, and transparency. Next slide, please. Um, now, B-Lab has been working to pass benefit corporation legislation around the country and the world um, for many years. We've also been working to educate the ecosystem about this new legal status. And um, the great news is that we've been successful in both of those pursuits. Um, we now have benefit corporation status available in upwards of 40 different states, and we're at a tipping point in both the public and the private markets and are seeing, you know, a um, broad acceptance of this new legal status. 
Um, you now have the who's who of, of the VC world um, who have benefit corporations in their portfolio. Um, you have benefit corporations that have done large capital raises. Um, and in the last 18 months, we've seen you know, eight different IPOs, four different SPACs, and four different public companies hold shareholder votes to adopt benefit corporation status. So this is really showing that the market has kind of uh, has now accepted that the benefit corporation form is legitimate. It's pretty exciting. Actually, in the last week, I've talked to two different companies who are planning to IPO as benefit corporations. So these numbers should be increasing um, soon as well. Next slide. Um, you know, but this can obviously be a, a little bit of a, a complicated process, which is why we're holding the webinar today. Um, but we've also have resources for you as you go through this um, journey to becoming a benefit corporation. Um, we've put together um, a tool called the board playbook, which brings together all of the information and resources, case studies, um, about the process to become a benefit corporation and includes information from um, you know, some of your peer companies on their journey to um, educate their board and their investors about the process to become a benefit corp. Um, I encourage you to check out that resource. It's got lots of great materials in it. And with that, I will turn it over to Kevin Christopher um, from Rockridge Venture Law. Thank you, Kevin, for being here today. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I, I come at this from a very personal level. Uh, I have started a handful of companies in the past and, and one of them actually kind of went through the negative aspects of, of shareholder primacy uh, in which we, we began as a social enterprise and, um, and then had to steer a little bit away from, from our core mission uh, because of, uh, of our investor makeup. And so uh, I'm a big proponent of the protections uh, within the benefit corporation framework. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here. Next slide, please. Uh, next one too, please. Thank you. Uh, so this is kind of a talk about shareholder primacy um, and uh, inclusion of all of your stakeholders uh, within your organization. And, and looking back on several decades of shareholder primacy, the, the, the leading advocates of shareholder primacy realized, hey, that wasn't such a good idea. Um, and there are several reasons for that. Next slide, please. The practical application of shareholder primacy uh, is that your company operates really for the purpose of pleasing shareholders. And oftentimes that can mean operating in a not quite sustainable fashion, really focused on quarterly profits, um, delaying investments in your people and in your infrastructure and in your community, uh, respecting the environment around you. Next slide, please. And, and what it has resulted in um, is what you see is sort of that, that dissonance within corporations uh, between the upper level management and, and those who do the work for the corporation. There's a footnote here, there's a great article by Lynn Stout that just covers the, the history of benefit corporations that you can check out. But one of the things that we've seen is this, this huge differential in CEO pay uh, during the, the course of shareholder primacy, the evolution of that. Um, and, and so there are lots of negatives. Sure, uh, next slide, please. Um, and, and, and one real life comparison is you look at our overall domestic production capability um, and, and the rise of pay alongside that. Uh, and since this sort of broad rollout of shareholder primacy, which just as a, as a reminder, is the corporate law maximum that the sole purpose of a corporation is to provide maximum return to shareholders. Uh, living under that construct of corporate law, uh, we've seen production go up, but we have not seen pay go up, just as one example of this. And there are lots of things, everybody's got stories of, of what they think um, has happened and resulted from shareholder primacy. Next slide, please. And so thanks to B-Lab and others, we have this benefit corporation structure, which uh, solidifies within your constitution, the framework of your corporation protections against shareholder primacy. Um, and as, uh, as Holly mentioned earlier, the three primary aspects, purpose, accountability, and transparency are what um, are, are baked into these uh, structures. Next slide, please. The model benefit corporation legislation has been adopted by many, many states. And I will touch upon some differences because 
Um, not all benefit corporation statutes look the same. Next slide, please. What you wanna do uh, if you are going to convert to a benefit corporation uh, from a standard C corporation within your state is first <laughs> review the board playbook because it's a wonderful tool for understanding how to communicate this. Uh, understanding what the requirements are within your state to convert to a benefit corporation. And as an example, if you are a corporation in Kentucky and wanna become a benefit corporation in Kentucky, there's a much, much higher threshold of shareholder adoption than there are in some other states. So, so you first need to know sort of the basics of where you are and what you need to do to be able to communicate that to your board and sell your board on that. Um, and then to communicate the reasons for that to your shareholders. So the first thing is really just kind of doing due diligence on where are you located and what are the minimum requirements for converting to either a benefit corporation within your state or to an external benefit corporation, for instance, a Delaware benefit corporation. Then you need to communicate that. I'm sorry, could you go backwards? Yeah. Then you need to communicate that to your shareholders. Uh, and uh, I recommend um, United Therapeutics is a good example of um, a, a great document uh, and, and selling point to their shareholders, laying out the reasons why they wanted to convert to a benefit corporation, what it was all about, their understanding of it, what it really meant. Um, so that's, a, that's an available document. We can pop that into the chat here that everybody can access. That's filed with the SEC, so you can see that. But there are good models out there for a very structured uh, approach to communicating that to, to shareholders so that you can pass that vote with confidence and at least communicate all the reasons for that and try and minimize um, any contest to that. Uh, and then once you obtain your shareholder approval, um, and again, it's, it's dependent upon where you are, um, then you can, can go forward with recertification or initial certification. Next slide, please. So just a few things here that I wanna bring up. So the model benefit corporation legislation, which has been wholly or nearly adopted in many states is somewhat different from a social purpose statute, um, which has been adopted in some states and called a benefit corporation statute in some dates, but it's really not. And the reasons why are that there are vast differences in the structure to those. So for instance, uh, the definition of a public benefit and what the requirements are for your stated purpose and your accountability might look very, very different in Delaware than it does in, say, Georgia or Kentucky or Tennessee, where I currently am. Your standards of conduct might be different in terms of who you have to include um, in the basis of your decision making, whether it's full on stakeholder inclusion or whether it's just kind of being mindful of some publicly stated benefit that's out there. And I used an example in a separate writing that in some of these states in the Southern states in particular, you could really champion say your local high school football team and that could be your public benefit under a social purpose statute. And so that's why in the requirements for B Corp, B -Corp certification, it's not just adopting whatever that statute is. Sometimes there's a little bit extra that you have to do in aligning that social purpose statute better with the model benefit corporation legislation. Next slide, please. Just some other examples of the transparency uh, and the accountability requirements, for instance. In, in some states with a social purpose statute, there's really no teeth, there's no accountability, there's no requirement for how you have to publicly show that you're walking the walk um, beyond just the talk of being uh, a benefit corporation. And so kind of understanding where you are and what you need to do to go beyond just whatever that statute says to truly align with this model legislation. Next slide, please. And this will all be available. Um, but here's what I referenced earlier. It's really important to understand where you are because in not all states is it the simple 51% majority um, of your shareholders that will convert you to a benefit corporation. In some states, um, you may have to really understand what is required to communicate and obtain that approval. Uh, and then you may additionally sometimes have to um, do something extra like per pay fair market purchase for someone who does not want to convert. So it's really important to just kind of understand in a first instance, where are you? Um, where do you need to convert? What are the requirements of that before you approach your board and your shareholders? 
and I'll be around for the Q&A session uh, to answer any specifics. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much. And with that, we will pass it off to our guest, Delita Costin from Grove Collaborative. Hi, Andy, thank you so much. Um, I am really happy to be here today because, uh, you know, going through the process of converting to a public benefit corporation for Grove Collaborative was something that um, we had to think about in a very, very, uh, you know, structured way. And it took us a while to be able to get the approvals internally to do it. So I want to sort of talk through, I think, some of the the ways that you can cross the hurdles as you, you go through the process. Um, my name is Delita Costin. I am the general counsel and uh, chief people officer at Grove Collaborative. And I was the champion within the company for our recertification for B Corp status. Um, you can go to the next slide, Karen. I think the first thing to keep in mind is to understand the why of converting to a public benefit corporation. Um, we started this conversation from a place of it being a requirement to remain certified as a B Corp. And um, there was just a lot of, of uh, challenge in getting us to wrap our heads around the benefits of doing it. Um, but once I sat down and I started to really think about our mission, um, the fact that our mission is part of our DNA and really learn what the public benefit corporation status might do for us. In addition to allowing us to maintain our BLAP certification, it became a much easier conversation within the company. And our mission is that we believe that consumer products will be a positive force for human and environmental health. So with that as our linchpin, we started to go through the, the process of socializing this conversion internally. Next slide, please. Um, it's important to keep in mind that B Corp certification is a legal status. It is not a certification. Um, and part of what made our conversation or our conversion, our conversations around conversion easy is that our mission, as I said, was in our DNA from the start. But as we looked out into what we wanted to do to expand our mission in the world, um, for instance, we believe that we can be plastic free by 2025 with all of our products. Um, we have uh, strong commitments to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. We want to change the face of participants within the natural products industry. We believed that going out and doing things like securing capital, partnerships with others in the community to help us meet those goals, um, our employees would really benefit by sending a strong signal that we had a commitment to public benefit goals. Um, the ESG ecosystem is incredibly noisy right now. There are many, many standards that companies can follow. There's B-Lab certification. There are a lot of ideas and theories around what ESG should mean, what sustainability means. And we thought that elevating the conversation to one where we put our stake in the ground and made this a legal status would be really beneficial to us. It's in a lot of ways more permanent than a certification. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, it is a legal status. So you can go through a certification every year, every couple of years, every three years, um, and kind of do what you need to do to pass the test or pass the assessments. Um, but the legal status is one that really becomes baked, baked into your governance. And once you adopt the public benefit uh, corporation status, you will find yourself out there in the world talking about it, but looking for ways to also demonstrate that um, it's more than just a value and that you're actually executing on your, your goals and your mission. So it may eventually lead to the need for other third-party validation um, in the future. So I think that's something to, to keep in mind. It's, it's B-Labs, but there are a lot of other certification um, frameworks that are out there that certain stakeholders might want you to follow as well. So um, it opens up the door for, for more in a lot of ways. Uh, it gives, and it 
puts legal expectations and liability onto a company in terms of, of governance. Um, Kevin talked a little bit about what some of those requirements might be in certain contexts, but it also gives companies a great deal of flexibility to go out and think about how they want to double down and execute on their mission. There is no one way to do it. And it allows for a certain amount of, of creativity with respect to prioritization and um, really getting creative and committed to the principles that, that matter. It's also a touchstone, as I said, for employees and customers who seek purpose-driven companies and products. One thing to keep in mind though, is that it is a legal status, which is relatively new in um, the United States. So expertise is growing and I'll talk a little bit about why that's important. And um, it is one of the reasons why I'm really excited that the lab has started these kinds of programs and done their board playbook because it is um, an ability for companies that are thinking about the conversion to, to share in some expertise. Um, so next slide, please, Karen. Gather your champions, all of them. This is a big decision. It can be a big decision internally. Next slide, Karen. The folks you need to talk to are, you know, just some of them listed here on, on the right. I will tell you that when we started the conversation about converting our lawyers, our accountants, our shareholders, um, who were also our board members were like, there's no way. It doesn't make sense for us to, to convert. Um, just in order to maintain certification. Um, and, you know, we really had to spend a lot of time doubling down on that mission, having those conversations about why it was important. We were going through the assessment at the same time that we were having those conversations. And the assessment itself um, really highlighted some of the areas and why it was important for us to start thinking um, in the way of converting to a public benefit corporation. So we eventually, along with some changes in Delaware law, were able to get our lawyers, our accountants, and our board through it. It was really easy for our executive team to, to commit to it because many of us joined the company because of our, our mission. Um, and for us, there wasn't really a segregation between our board and our shareholders. There's a technical requirement that Kevin talked about, which is that you need to get your board to approve and then your shareholders. In our case, we are um, still a venture backed company and we have um, incredible overlap between our board and our shareholders. So it was a conversation that we were able to have once and kind of get done all within the same day, which was, which was great. Um, so everyone will have an opinion on what the uh, public benefit corporation status will do for your company, will do for the world, but it's really important if you uh, think about my first point to understand your why and really bake the process and think about what you'll do as you try to meet your why. Next slide, Karen. Um, and then the last thing is just to breathe life into it and make it yours. Next slide. Um, ESG standards are emerging and the opportunity exists to think outside of the box. There are so many different ways to think about ESG, sustainability, governance. I mean, the category and the field is just huge and big. Um, and so really take the time to think about how you want to live the principles that you're signing up for in your new charter. You can seek out other PBCs for partnerships and those are thought partnerships on, with respect to how they're you know, dealing with governance changes that are going to, to follow after you convert. Um, it can be for business partnerships, um, but really seek out other PBCs and start to learn because those of us who are doing this now are in a lot of ways the forefront of a, of a trend that's going to just continue to magnify and, and move forward. And we, we will be setting um, a lot of that thought leadership and that expertise. So seek out others and learn and create. Um, use different standards and frameworks to help prioritize and evangelize. We were definitely um, motivated to do this because we wanted to maintain our B Lab, our B Corp certification. But we also took a look at the Global Reporting Initiative Sustainability Accounting Standards, 
There is a task force on climate related financial disclosure disclosures. We talked to our investors um, and we talked to potential investors about what standards they thought were important. And we um, really took the best of a lot of those and started to meld them into our own internal operations. Um, as well as thinking about strategy as we, we move forward to make that mission really continue to breathe. Um, next point is to be intentional, uh, breathing uh, PBC and ESG standards into the business and governance. And, you know, I think the, the last point here is about balancing those interests. It is really easy in the boardroom still for um, us to really default to what's the best interest of the, the shareholders, the stockholders, our investors. And, you know, for me as a GC or the chief uh, legal officer, really starting to have that conversation around, well, let's look at the other stakeholders who are out there. How does this benefit the community? Does it tie into our goals to be plastic free? Um, and being intentional about introducing those conversations I think is, is important. And there are a lot of different ways to, to do it, um, but, but seek out those ways. And it's okay if those conversations in the boardroom are a little bit different than what they've been in the past. Everybody is learning it. And I think it makes for richer discussions for the decisions that we need to make. And I think that's it, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Delita. Very much appreciate that. Uh, so we've been answering some questions here in the Q&A, and I'm going to ask one question for uh, both of our panelists, and I'll ask it now, so I'll give you a little time to think about it while I take one of the questions that was just asked, and that is, uh, what needs to change or what needs to happen in this momentum in the market uh, for this to be something that's not just a trend, but something that's more normative and institutional? And so I think Holly, Kevin, Delita, you all brought up on more VC firms are talking about this. We're starting to see more companies test this in the public market. What then needs to happen for this to become uh, more broadly accepted and adopted in the market? Uh, one thing that we noticed was that when we first founded B-Lab about 14 years ago, uh, there were zero mentions in the press around upending shareholder primacy. In 2020 alone, there were 7,100 mentions. I think we see a lot of these levers happening from folks like the Business Roundtable uh, or the narrative and the purpose of folks like Mark Benioff and Salesforce. Uh, so we'd love to hear from you all on your thoughts on that. While you think about that, I'm gonna answer one question from the Q&A, uh, which is what's the difference between B Corp certification and benefit corporation? Uh, so this is the age old top question uh, that is asked uh, of our work. So we apologize for uh, skipping over that if that was not clear. Uh, so B-Lab is the nonprofit. We created both uh, in partnership with a bunch of folks like Kevin and others to get this to be passed, you know, state by state. Uh, B Corp certification is almost like a housekeeping seal of approval that companies earn by going through an assessment and looking at a broad base of impact areas, workers, community, governance, uh, the environment. Uh, and one way that I heard this was from uh, an iconic entrepreneur and the founder of Patagonia. And Yvonne Schwinnard said, you know, I really liken this uh, legal structure, Benefit Corp, almost like a conservation easement on a piece of land before a company. How do I make sure that this 65-year-old experiment of Patagonia uh, continues and remains purpose-driven long beyond me? And as we all saw, there have been a couple of changes of leadership at Patagonia. Uh, with Rose Macario taking, taking the helm uh, after him. Now that is a legal structure of how do you make sure that land or that conservation easement for the company continues. The certification then steps in to say what's happening on that land? What's happening? How are the farmers being treated? Uh, is there carbon sequestration? Is it regenerative agriculture? What's it like to take that crop to the shelf and that distribution, the carbon? And so we see these things as uh, being mutually interdependent on one another. One is that consumers, investors, job seekers want to tell the difference between a good company and what's just good marketing. And so we needed to have a company level certification. And then I think what we've been hearing about today is that that's not enough. And so when companies are looking at potential exit strategies or it's a family run company and wanting to pass it down to your offspring, how to really bake in employee ownership, that's where the legal structure comes in is how do we expand that fiduciary duty 
uh, so that we're accountable to more than just one bottom line. And so the quick answer is that to certify, you have to work through BLAB or the certifying entity. To become a benefit corporation, you can work with the Secretary of State's office of any state of where it's being passed. Uh, and you can now just opt into becoming a benefit corp without ever working with us. Uh, our role is to get it passed and to socialize it and make sure you have the tools and resources to know how to do it and to mitigate any risk along the way. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to pass that question over to, to Kevin and Delita of what are you seeing? What needs to change? And maybe what is a risk that maybe you see on this being more adopted in, in a way that affirms the original intention and, and the breadth of, of what the statute uh, contains. So maybe I'll start with you, Kevin. And Kevin, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, I think that was a great explanation of separating sort of the, the business aspects of that certification mark, that trust mark, um, from the legal aspects of, of the underlying benefit corporation, uh, which is, is really about protecting your interests. If you're, if you're um, a, a startup company and you have some mission-oriented founders that have a vision for what this company is, uh, I use Warby Parker a lot, just it's, it's easy and elementary. But if, if, if you have some startups who they want to take that forward and they say, hey, you know, this aspect of one-to-one, -one, this is core, this is integral to what we want to be as a company. You don't want to grow and then grow with institutional investment like venture capital or pension fund investors who say, that's cute, that's great, but you know what, it, it, hurts, our, it hurts our profitability, it hurts our dividends, and so we're going to kind of get rid of that. You know, everybody knows you now, you're fancy, you're in, you're in vogue. Um, they don't care about that one-to-one -one mission, so we're just going to kind of scrap that. Nobody will really notice. That's the sort of thing of, of where shareholder primacy can kind of come in and really put pressure um, on company management to deviate from its core principles. And so what I see, I, Andy and Holly, you know, in, being in Tennessee, I have a, a, a passion for our southern states kind of getting on board. I, I think we need better communication to the state legislatures to understand what this is so that we don't wind up with these sort of backhanded types of statutes. Um, Kentucky is a good example. It takes 90% uh, shareholder vote to convert from a corporation to a benefit corporation in Kentucky, but it only takes two thirds shareholder vote to go the other way, <laughs> to go from a benefit corporation to a regular corporation. And that's just sort of backhanded to me. So I think that um, explaining the benefits of this, explaining that um, you know, it, it, it can be a big win. Uh, there are some, um, Andy, you mentioned Yvonne Chouinard, there are some great, uh, a couple of, uh, of, 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 of great brochures that come out of the, the Yale Center for Business and Environment that look at the profitability and the, the investor basis for benefit corporations and, and, and why they're so great and why they make sense and how they're even more productive um, than their peers. So I think it says just continued education about what this is, is it's not the boogeyman, it's what people really want, and, and it makes sense for a sustainable company and a sustainable community. Yeah, I agree with everything Kevin said. I'm going to answer the question from somebody who's internal to a company. Um, I think that one of the things it takes is just going to be commitment and dedication and consistency. It is really, really easy to fall back into a framework of looking at what the investors want you to, to do. Um, what are the decisions that will maximize their return on the dollar? Um, and it takes a lot of, I think, courage internally for the management team to really kind of confront and continue to push conversations and agendas that might deviate from that. It doesn't mean that we're going to win every one of those um, conversations, and it doesn't mean that we should win every one of those conversations, but really surfacing other opinions and other interests that need to be considered is something that, um, especially given the, the change that this is making in, in governance, I think it's something that um, really does require intentionality in a way that other things, other things haven't. Um, and I also think that, you know, Kevin talked a little bit about the march towards creating better statutes. These statutes are still really new. And so there is still a little bit of a discomfort with respect to 
in the end, when the cases end up being litigated and the fights play out in the courts, what will really be the landing place for risk and liability? We kind of know what that looks like, at least in Delaware with Delaware general corporation law. We don't completely understand that with the public benefit corporations. And so the process of time is just what it is. And over time, we'll have more certainty. And I think it's just important to embrace the fact that there's a little bit of uncertainty now and be able to be creative about explaining why that uncertain risk is actually a risk worth taking um, as you're talking to different folks out there and different stakeholders out there. So in my mind, it's just remembering that we do still operate in a very traditional capitalist society where shareholder privacy is the norm um, and looking for all kinds of opportunities to really challenge that. Um, and at the same time, you know, grow the business in a way so that it can continue to execute on, on its mission and its values. Wonderful, thank you, Delita, and thank you, uh, Kevin, and um, special gratitude to Delita and the team at Grove Collaborative. A lot of our early conversations is what inspired the production of the board playbook and this series to hopefully provide more resources and transparency uh, on some of the questions and the toughest questions that these companies are facing and how they've worked through and overcome some of those roadblocks. Uh, you'll see here a few extra resources. We highlighted in yellow what we thought would be most relevant for you all here today. Um, if you have any questions that were not answered, feel free to reach out to us at support at bcorporation.net. Uh, this will be recorded. And so we will send this over in follow-up and email. Feel free to share this uh, out, uh, out to anybody who you think might benefit from it. Um, also, I saw that Stephanie Hurst is here from Mayor Brown. So uh, Mayor Brown is also a partner in putting together the uh, board playbook. So Stephanie, thanks for joining us here. Uh, and appreciate you all taking the time. This concludes our series on uh, looking at the B Corp legal framework for companies. And we hope it's been uh, worth your time and wish you all safe and happy holidays. And we'll talk to you, talk to you in the new year. All right, take care, everybody.